Welcome to In the Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile, build something bold, and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm really excited to have on the show today, Brennan Dunn, who is the founder of Double Your Freelancing Rate and of the Software as a Service Business Plan Scope, which helps freelancers and consultants basically plan their projects, close more deals, and uh, generally just help them do better at what they do, which is pretty cool, and we'll dig into that in a little bit. But Brandon, thanks so much for being on the call with us today. Yeah, no, thank you, Tom, for having me. Awesome. So let's backtrack a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your kind of your origin story, if you will. Your it, before you were doing PlanScope, before you were doing double your freelancing rate, um, and 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 creating these products, digital products and services and stuff like that. What were you doing before then? Yeah. So my my background was. I was down, so I used to live in Florida. Now I live in, up in Virginia. And I was working at this agency, which was really my exposure, I guess, to working with clients. Now, when I started there, I was just kind of a underling developer. It was a bigger interactive agency. And within a few months, I'd kind of climbed the ranks to being in charge of the whole technology department, I guess, at the agency. So, you know, things were going really well. I was getting to work with like these huge brands like Starwood Resorts and a bunch of airlines and stuff like that. And then, uh, lo and behold, my wife and I got pregnant, and she wanted to move back up north uh, here in Virginia to where her family lives. So, you know, here I was. I had this awesome job. We were. I was traveling a lot. I was making six figures in my early twenties, and I had to quit to uh, basically move uproot my whole life. Right. So I um, we moved up north, and I kind of had to become a freelancer out of necessity. I didn't really know of any businesses in the area. I mean, it's not exactly a high tech area where I live now. So I ended up just uh, freelancing for a college friend of mine out in San Francisco. And at the time, I had no idea like what I was doing in terms of pricing or I didn't I mean, I wouldn't even thought I was running a business. I just figured, you know, I'm, it's like I'm an employee, but um, not <laughs> if that makes sense. So I, you know, I did this for a while and I kept getting referrals Right. And I didn't really know, again, what to do with them or anything like that. So I got to this fork in the road where I could either scale the company or I could turn away work. So I decided to scale because I've, I've always had an entrepreneurial bent. I wanted to kind of build a company and it would be great if I could have I mean, back of the napkin math would say that if I had uh, five people working for me and I'm building them out at 100 bucks an hour and I'm paying them, let's say, 50 an hour. That's you know, that's pretty good for me. So I. um you know, I started up a company, an agency of my own, and grew to 11 employees. And <clears throat> what it ended up happening was I kind of got bit by that product bug, I guess. Mm -hmm. I had built this company. We were doing a few million a year in revenue. My payroll was through the roof just because hiring engineers isn't cheap. And um, so we were kind of low margin but high revenue. And we had a few clients who would pay our bills. Like we had maybe at any given time four clients uh, who were paying us, which meant that if any of them walked or if any of them, uh, we had big like, you know, payment issues or anything like that, it could be pretty stressful. And it was at times. So I decided that, you know, not only that, I had also ended up kind of in retrospect, I realized I was living in the suburbs. My office was downtown. I was driving, I was commuting there every day. Um, I was there nine to six every day and I basically created a job for myself and I really wanted to get away from that. So like I mentioned, I got bit by the product bug. I realized I had this asset, this agency, and it was generating revenue for me, even though I wasn't, you know, I was involved day to day. I wasn't coding. I wasn't like I had a salesperson. I had a, I had a lot of the parts figured out for me. So I decided to bootstrap this software product plan scope which was that project management tool that I wanted at the agency that didn't exist. So I did that and then I realized I couldn't, I couldn't focus both on PlanScope and the agency, so I exited the agency and really just focused headfirst on PlanScope, making it, you know, trying to make it amazing. What ended up happening from there, which is where a lot of this, like the courses and stuff you mentioned came from, mm -hmm. was 
people would go right into the support email address of PlanScope, and they would ask me questions about like, uh, you know, hey, do you have any advice on on increasing my my prices, or do you have any, um, you know, uh, thoughts on getting clients or or whatever, right? Things that I kind of thought were out of scope. Like, you know, this is a project management tool. It's not, you know, you're you're asking things that are kind of unrelated to what the tool is about. But I guess people had heard about that I'd run an agency and what kind of like, you know, an insider's perspective on business. But where it really started to click was when I started getting cancellation emails that would say things like uh, ran out of work. And and I realized people were canceling for that reason. So I started doing a lot of these kind of one off uh, email consults in a way, I guess, where I would just advise people or I jump on Skype with them and and um, eventually got to the point where I. I realized I could just, you know, I was saying the same thing again and again. So that's when I created my first, I guess, info product for lack of a better way of putting it, which was a uh, double your freelancing rate, which at the time was a book. And I did this and I was, you know, I'm an engineer. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to get into that whole like ebook thing at mm-hmm. all. But I did it anyway. And I, you know, made the decision to email it to my PlanScope uh, customer base, really anyone who'd ever signed up for PlanScope. That was my audience at the time. Like if you ever signed up for a trial, you were on my list. And I emailed it to them and I got a good amount of people buying. I mean, I made like a few thousand dollars worth um, when I launched that first uh, kind of training product of mine. And I was really, you know, I was just scared to death that people were going to like be like, ha, I caught you. This is crap. Like I want a refund or something like that. But instead I got the opposite. And, uh, you know, it was just re- me relaying on things I'd learned growing my agency. And um, I was just sharing it. So I did that. And I got a lot of positive feedback and it kept going and I would get referral sales now. And I realized that, you know, I had the SaaS, but within about a year, the training side of my business, which was really just one product at the time, one one ebook was eclipsing PlanScope's revenue. So I, um, you know, I was kind of at another decision point. Um, and, you know, PlanScope's still around. I have a team who's working on it for me, but it's not my day-to-day focus. I'm not all in on PlanScope. Now I'm really mostly all in with the training products because what's happening is people will go through W Refluence Rate and then they say, this is great. Now I know how to sell. Now I know how to write proposals, but I don't have anyone to sell to. And that's where, for instance, my, my latest course, which is now um, well over a year old, is, uh, you know, came from, which is now about how do you get clients and all these kind of things from my podcast to my courses to my blog and everything just started to take off from really answering people's questions at first individually and then kind of uh, doing it at scale. That's awesome. So when you shut down your agency, what did you, how did you roll that back? Did you sell it or what, like to shift over to uh, the software? So my business development head, um, I didn't want to, so I had an acquisition offer by a local software company. And the problem with that was they wanted me to be part of the sale. So yep. one of the hard parts about selling a services company is it's usually not, you don't have like intellectual property, you have people. So, um, you know, I was part of the sale and I didn't want to get commit to two years of working for a company that I re- just wasn't passionate about mm-hmm. at all, what they were doing. Um, so I turned that down. And what I ended up doing instead was telling um, my head of biz dev, look, let's do this. I'm going to withdraw from the company. You know, I'm not going to be a part of it day to day. I'm not going to come into the office or anything like that. Actually, I'm going to shut down the office because the last thing I want is to have all these liabilities if I'm not um, in charge, if I'm not yep. you know, active with it. So but that being said, we have a brand. We have lead flow. We have referrals coming in and everything else. So let's do this. Any. You know, you've, he's been selling for the most part for a few years at this point uh, for me. So it was up to him to vet, you know, inbound leads, sell them, and then find one of our, I converted all of our employees to independent contractors because a lot of them wanted to start their, their own thing or to become their own freelancers. <clears throat> but like I mentioned, we had this this brand that was already bringing in a lot of work and all, these people would all work together for, you know, a while now and everything. So the deal was, Anything you bring in and that you pair up with one of our former employees, basically as a matchmaker, um, you keep 50% of the profit and I'll keep 50%. So, you know, I was making a few thousand a month. It wasn't, it wasn't what I was making 
uh, when I was day to day running the agency. But I was making a few thousand a month really for nothing. Um, it was I had created this asset that was in a way kind of running itself. But at the end of the day, I, I knew there was a fuse because I knew I was kind of integral to the brand success. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was still it, it couldn't just it wasn't a self perpetuating machine. So I um, I knew there was about a fuse, and yeah, about a year and a half later, our lead flow fizzled out uh, for good. But you know, it was at that point that I was already able to scale up the other businesses I'd started in that time period, and it really wasn't a big deal for me, uh, to be honest. Even though yes, I I spent all this time building up this brand, but um, yeah, I mean, consulting at that point, or at least the agency at that point, was really a means to an end for me. Um, and I think in a different life, had I not had kids, had I not had kind of a, a family life and everything, and if I was okay with just being on the road nonstop, because we had clients all over the world, and you know I love traveling, and I would love to jet set to you know all over all the time, mm-hmm. but it didn't really work out with the home life that I had. So um, I think in a different life, I would have been able to really scale the company. We had 11 employees. I could have brought it up to a few dozen probably if I would have committed to that. Yeah, that's interesting. I was just really curious about that. How I, I think that's a, a quite a clever way to do it, though. Too, um, I, I feel like that's also one of the fears too of kind of building up a, an agency type model is um, part of it. You know, creating a job for yourself. Well, you, yeah, I mean, you don't want yourself to be part of the product right. forever. And I, you know, in retrospect, there were things I didn't know about management that I know now, and about company culture that I know now. That if I could start again, I would have done it differently just because I've had, you know, I've done a lot of research in the time being Mm -hmm. and have, you know, know a lot of agency owners now, know hundreds of them really, who, um, who some of them have done really well in terms of being able to kind of distance themselves from the company. Um, obviously, you know, they're still integral to it, but there was a point where if I wasn't showing up at the office, it would kind of not cause mutiny, but you know, like people would think that I'm just kind of chilling while they're doing all the hard work, or whatever. Which so, wasn't the case, but yeah. You, I'm curious about this. Like you said, I wasn't expecting to go this way, but or go this route. But tell me, like, what, from in your opinion, if if you were to do it d- differently, especially from a managerial perspective, what what were some of those things that you think about would would have probably improved the business as a whole? I mean, I think what I would have done differently would have been to really productize what we were doing. So. It wasn't like what was basically happening was I had, you know, I was in, I was the head of sales, I guess, even though I had somebody doing a lot of the qualification work for me. Um, But at the end of the day, what ended up happening was we would sell a client and then we would assign that client's project to a team internally. So maybe just one person or three or, you know, however many they needed. And it was kind of like we were almost a glorified matchmaking service where, you know, we were bringing the work and then handing it off. I think if I would have done more in tune, in line or more to the end of having a recurring productized model instead of these one-off big projects, like a lot of our projects were multi-six-figure price points, and but we're one-off. So we do a project, it would last three, four, five months, and then we deliver it, and then we'd start again. Um, I think if I could have really productized the hell out of how we worked, and really made it so we had a very well-oiled machine from everything from acquisition to uh, ongoing delivery, I guess. Um, You know, from how we onboard, you know, how we manage the projects, how all these really like more or less turnkey things that we could have done to deliver that business value that we promise, but make it in such a way that it's not just assigning smart people to a project. Instead, it's having a lot of smart people who are each fulfilling a certain role. And um, it's not, you know, it's more, it's more turnkey, if that makes sense. Um, So, you know, I would have done that differently, wouldn't have been a brick and mortar company. I mean, I think there's nothing wrong with having a brick and mortar company just wasn't, um, you know, I I wanted a more, I like more asynchronous business models, I guess, where that was very synchronous. You had to physically be there. You had to physically be doing meetings. You had to physically be, um, you know, doing all these different things uh, live. Whereas now my new business, even though I have a lot of people working for me now, it's almost all like async via Slack or email or something like that. And it's more conducive, I guess, to 
both my lifestyle and the lifestyle and the people who work for me now. So um, I think that was the that was the big issue. I wanted to have a very centrally run, uh, in person traditional business, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. But for the kind of business that I wanted to run, which was more, um, yeah, delivering amazing value to our clients, but not being tied to a nine to five or a nine to six in our case, um, you know, I would have I would have changed exactly what we did and, and how we delivered and how we ran internally um, in a lot of different ways to make that happen. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, do you believe that any type of uh, agency type work or, or freelancing work can be productized in that way? Um, does that make sense, that question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think... Especially in higher priced ones, kind of like you mentioned. Yeah, because we did a lot of like building startups from scratch or building like an internal app that would run like a sales division of the company. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that kind of stuff is a lot harder to do because it's not one size fits all. Like each project can be significantly different than the others, right? So, you know, you go from like a Facebook clone to a internal CRM. They're totally different products. Um, but I think... For something like that, I mean, the only the only way I would say yes for that would be if you had more of a, let's say you get a lot of clients who need some sort of like foundational CRM plus something else. Because um, then what you can do is you can really offer licensing instead of just build it and deliver. You could do things like where you have kind of a central proprietary thing that you own and then you can mm. kind of maintain over time. It's kind of like a, a very smaller SaaS model, but a higher price point, if that makes sense, because it's actual custom code and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I mean, especially let's say you do uh, big website projects, big web app projects. Um, you could easily convert a lot of your clients who you built something from scratch for to a recurring model where you're helping them. I mean, how many SaaSes have you seen that look the same when they first launched them as they do now, right? Um, and a lot of clients we worked for didn't have anyone internal who could do ongoing testing or, you know, really look at the funnels and see are people actually converting or aren't they? And if they aren't, what should we do to make them convert? And kind of that ongoing testing. Like, I think there's a lot of room for uh, traditional, like let's say, web developers who build applications to offer ongoing, recurring uh, value to their clients, and the benefit of that is that now you've got now you've got a you know potentially a few people who are paying you, let's say, a few thousand a month, um, recurring, and that lessens the amount of time you need to sell, lessens kind of the um, the the that kind of uh, I guess that that stress and that churn that, that kind of happens inevitably when you're always doing new stuff. I mean, there's something really exciting about that, right? Like there's that exciting aspect of getting to work on new projects, but it's really hard to, you don't really own anything at that point, right? Whereas you could own a process for how you grow SaaS businesses. And yes, maybe your first clients could be people that you built their prototype SaaSes from scratch. But later on, you can start selling people directly on the more recurring model, um, you know, instead of having it be an upsell after you complete a project. Interesting. Yeah, this is this is cool. Good stuff to think about. I'm, I'm actually taking some notes here. So now I'm curious about like some of those, uh, you know, in terms of like, I suppose when it comes to to being uh, an agency or or, or, conduct, or having some sort of consultancy, um, the biggest challenges in some ways, and I think you address this in your in your your books and your info products and stuff like that, um, is is how is is that kind of structure because that's interesting. So we're we're looking at that as like how to how to productize. Well, I'm curious, like you know, let's talk a little bit about pricing and about creating contracts that actually uh, that that clients want to pay for um, because this is interesting. So now my brain's in two places, like how you would do that for something that will be recurring. Uh, versus like a one-off, but maybe we talk about some of the principles just of creating a good good contract and um, of like increasing your rates. So I know that's a broad topic. I know you have a whole book on it, but, <laughs> but maybe we can talk about some of the key points that that come to mind. Sure. So I think the the foundation needs to be the understanding that no one's ever paid you for code or design or whatever it is you happen to do. Um, 
you know, people, people obviously, let's say you're a web developer. Yes, they're paying you and you're writing code for them. But why they're actually paying you is for some business result that they're hoping that code brings to them. Um, so, you know, if you're building a website from scratch, people aren't really spending five figures on a website. They're spending five figures hoping that the website gets them more than five figures, probably in new customers or new sales or something like that. Um, so I think at, at the foundation needs to be that understanding of, you know, people spend money for solutions, not for technicalities, technicals. So that being said, how does that affect then how you sell? Um, I think the, the, the thing that I've seen, and again, like you mentioned, I've, I've got a whole course on this and I've, I've, have, mm -hmm. I've collected a lot of data about like kind of what shifts have happened in kind of people's mentalities and the way they work to allow them to substantially increase their pricing. And the biggest thing has been first that understanding of no one's really paying for what it is you do. They're paying for what it is you do can do for them. And using that to change the way you qualify, the way you sell, the way you propose projects to clients. So, you know, when you go to sell a client instead of, or when you go to write a proposal, instead of doing the typical like executive summary and then like bullet list of like everything you'll do and then this is how much we'll charge an hour or this is the total project budget and then like a timeline. Instead, make it more of like a sales letter where, you know, mm -hmm. this is the problem we're here to solve. This is the payoff, the potential payoff if it's solved correctly. So that means understanding exactly, you know, what what really pro what problem is at the root of the project that was brought to you? What um, how does that problem? What is it worth to them? Right. Like to be solved, like wh what would solving that problem do for them? And then what would solving that problem allow them to then do with that upside? So if it's, um, let's say it's a business that has a website that, you know, like they have like an online storefront, let's say, and they have a e-commerce store and they're not getting the sales they want. They might think, they might think I'm going to go hire a web designer and just start from scratch. I'm going to fire what I have now and just do it again. And if you are that web designer and they come to you and you're just tasked with uh, building a new online store. I think a lot of us just default to, all right, like let's talk about how to look and like what, you know, platform will it run on and blah, 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 blah. But instead, if you can think like, why are you, you know, try to really figure out why are they firing their old online store? What, what was really keeping them from getting the results they're looking for? Is it maybe a messaging problem? Is it a design problem? Is it a, um, funnel problem is it an email problem like try to figure out exactly what what things are keeping them from growing the way they want to grow and then selling the solution which is just re removing all these problems and that could mean a brand new e-commerce site or that could mean just changing a few thing key things that could mean maybe just adding um email automation right i mean there's so many different mm -hmm. potential solutions that you know can result in the solution they're looking for. And so just changing the way that you, you know, from the beginning, when somebody reaches out to you, instead of just talking about the project on the table, really try to drill back and figure out what is actually the problem that they're here to solve. And that's going to set you apart from most, most of your competition, because most people are just talking about, you know, the look, the feel, the CMS, the, you know, all, all this stuff, like the, the logo, the colors, all, you know, all that kind of stuff. But if you can really just focus on realizing that all of those things are just the bridge, that's just the way to get from point A to point B, from where they are now yep. to where they want to get to. And if you can figure out the best way to cross that gap, maybe that's a different looking, different style bridge than they came to you with. Um, you know, that's that's what really being a consultant means. It's It's getting away from just being an order taker and instead really trying to get at the root of the problem and coming up with a solution and you being the one to take charge and saying, this is how, this is the best way for your budget, for your timeline, for your needs to get there. And, you know, when you start doing that, then you're not just a commoditized provider. Instead, you're, you're more of an ally. You're more of a partner that can help them, you know, get to where they need to get to, which is ideally a more profitable tomorrow, which if you can help them figure out what quantifiably does that mean for them, then you can sell yourself as an investment instead of just a, you know, a risky expense. 
And if you can sell your, if you can give them a clear path to saying, here's a, here's a real realistic way to do X, Y, and Z and to increase your revenue this year in the first year alone by, let's say, half a million dollars. Then when you quote them for something that is, let's say, above market rates, um, whatever that might be, let's say, you know, a $40,000 project where most would charge 5000 Well, when you're saying, here's how you can spend 40000 to real realistically make 500000 that's much different than saying, spend 5000 and you'll get a website. Because getting a website doesn't imply any result, doesn't imply any solution of any sort. But when you spell it out clearly and show them that your role is not just to build a website. Your role is to get them to where they need to get to business-wise. And yes, a website will help them do that, but it's not what's being built. Uh, or it's not it's not what's being paid for, if that makes sense. Totally. No, I love this. And and I, I'm only like halfway through or maybe a quarter of the way through the book. Um, I can't wait to dig into the rest of it and the rest of the course and everything you have. But for those who are just listening to this and thinking like this is gold, um, head over to doubleyourfreelancing.com and uh, sign up to Brennan's list. So I got a couple more questions, Brennan, if you have a little more time. Go for it, yeah. Awesome. Um, so big question here is then lead generation, uh, which I know you, I think you just started a new one, which is get more clients, uh, a new new info product or new new education course on how to get more clients. So tell me, you know, this is one of the challenges I struggle with right now, or not really a challenge, but I could see it in the future being a, a challenge. So I do, um, I do book launches and I do book publishing. So book publishing is kind of the full service type of thing, and we're actually publishing through Insurgent Publishing. And then the book launches are I'm helping authors either traditionally publish or self-published market and launch their books in a, in a big way. Um, and, and what's interesting is every basically like 95% of the people I've worked with have come in through referrals. But I know that'll probably dry up eventually, right? I can't just expect that I'll continue to get referrals. So I'm curious right, how you go whole, from... What's that? It's that whole like you're, right now you're kind of relying off luck to a degree. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you like systematically think through the process of like going from, okay, I know I do a good job because people are referring me, but how do I actually find these people? Um, like, is there, is there a thought process that goes into that? How, how do you like, how do you frame that? How do you start like figuring out a way, a system to actually uh, acquire clients if you've never really had one? Yeah. So that's, so again, when, when I had this agency, our payroll yeah. was a hundred thousand plus a month. And we, for a while, relied off just referrals. But when you have all these fixed expenses, that becomes really scary, thinking that, like, yeah, if I don't get 100000 plus in work um, this month, then I don't know what I'm going to do, <laughs> right? So what I think, again, just like at the, when I talked about pricing, at the, at the foundation of pricing is understanding that you're not being paid for what it is you do, but instead for what it is you, uh, what, what you create ends up doing for them. For the client, I think the same. There needs to be another kind of foundational layer when it comes to um, kind of lead generation or getting clients. And the way that I look at it now is: so right now you have former clients who may or may not refer work to you. And the problem with that is that referral base only scales as quickly as you add new clients, and you can yep. only work on so many clients at once, right? So if you have, let's say, ten total clients. That means that you have 10 people who have received value from you, meaning they've received a project from you. They think that the value they got outweighed what they put into it, meaning they got a return on investment for that. And then they're at the point where they confront somebody in the field, let's say at a, you know, a peer of theirs or something, who needs something like what you can provide. So, you know, there's a lot of things that need to happen. And, and there's a lot of luck in, in place, especially that latter part where they happen to meet the right person to refer you to. Um, so with that being said, though, if the people who refer you have received um, a, a, something valuable from you, a project from you, well, what if you could then deliver a lot of value to people who haven't committed to you financially yet? So what if you could increase that luck surface area, that referral surface area by having more people who know what you do and have received something of value from you who are then potential referral sources for you. And that's exactly what we did with my agency. So what we ended up doing was we would do things like um, hosting. I mean, granted, our business model was very in person in a lot of ways, but we would host you know, business seminars um, at first at other people's places, eventually in our own office. 
where we would teach people about kind of the high level stuff of what we did. So, you know, we would have a seminar on, let's say, should you build something custom or buy something off the shelf, pros and cons of each, talk for about 50 minutes. And now they'd be, if they haven't, if they weren't already, now they'd be on our list. They'd be invited to future events of ours. We do things like, um, uh, anytime we'd launch a project, we'd go out to a bar and invite everyone on, on our list who's local to come out, first drinks on us. We would do these events where we would bring in like local angel investors and have them give talks on uh, how to fundraise. So all these different things that were kind of on our periphery in terms of the kind of people who would go there are the kind of people that may or may become may or may not become clients of ours. But we didn't do a lot of this with the intention of bringing in people to sit through a seminar who might become a direct client of ours. Instead, we, we thought, well, what if we could get people in who we could deliver a lot of value to at scale, right? So, you know, we could have 30, 40 people in the room, give one hour talk, and now we've just affected 30 or 40 people and really delivered value to them, increased the amount of trust they have with us, increased the exposure that they have, you mm-hmm. know, when it comes to us and so on. And we just did this a lot. And I mean, we never really did it online, but nowadays with my own business, I'm doing this online with uh, webinars or my um, my blog or the content I create that's free. And this is a way just to give more, just to really deliver value to people in a way that in a way that's either that's ideally scalar and ideally also evergreen. So it mm-hmm. works kind of independently of me showing up and giving a talk. But um, that was our whole strategy, which was increase the amount of people who have received value from us. And then on top of that, keep them close. So invite them to more things, uh, send them, send them additional value. We would do things like if we would read interesting articles online, we would just package them up and curate them in a little monthly newsletter thing and just blast it out to our list. And it would be things like, instead of it just being like a link list, we would actually go in depth, not in depth, but like a paragraph for each article we link to. And kind of pull out the takeaways and the highlights from our perspective. And we would also close these emails with simple things like, hey, if you got any, um, if you got an idea about maybe something you could do to grow your business from any of these articles, reply and let us know what that is. We'd love to, we'd love to talk to you about it. Um, And that's what would spawn a lot of sales discussions. Or we do things like if they go to a, a, a seminar of ours, we would follow up with a few emails that kind of really drill more in depth. Like if we did a talk on internet marketing, the talk itself would be very high level, but then we would send them a few emails for a week or two afterward where we would dive in deeper and show them how to create their own uh, campaigns on AdWords and how to set up an ad and then how to look at the results and all that kind of stuff. And then finally, we would just send them a simple email that said, hey, I hope you've been getting a lot um, from all the training that we've been offering you. What we want to make sure as the people teaching you this is that you don't just do nothing with it. So um, reply and let's talk and let's figure out a time where we can help you figure out what your next steps are um, to help grow your business, you know, using, in this case, uh, you know, online ads. And this was kind of a very low pressure, you know, it's a sales call, but it's not a sales call because we're basically saying we want to help you figure out what to do next. But our ideal client was somebody who was not a do-it-yourselfer, was not the type who was going to say, great, I'm just going to spend like a few weeks learning everything I can about online marketing and then do it all myself. Um, so we didn't want that kind of person. And we didn't want the kind of person who realized or we wanted the kind of person who realized that they had better things to do than to do this. Like, you know, they'd already they already know we're legitimate. Like a lot of the selling has already been done. Um, and, and through this process where we're just delivering a lot of value at scale, we would routinely close six plus figure projects in 10, 15 minutes because all the selling had already happened. All we had to do was negotiate timelines and dates, and, you know, budget and everything like that. We didn't really need to convince them, uh, you know, if that makes sense. So I guess the long and short of it is, again, referrals, which are the best way to get clients, come typically from your past clients but you can't grow that pool of past clients very quickly. So instead, that same formula, which is deliver somebody value, keep them in touch um, or keep in touch with them, keep delivering them more value and gently nudge them about either hiring you or referring you. Um, 
you know, just that formula, that's what we apply to our own business. And we eventually had, you know, more than 3000 people locally to us, 3000 businesses, whether it's, um, you know, CEOs or managers or whoever, um, some of them who were just like college kids who would show up at our events and stuff. And we had more than 3000 of them in our immediate network who these people were kind of like an army of referrals or people who would refer to us or refer work to us kind of out in the field. We were always, you know, we were always at the tip of their mind because we were always giving them more and more value. So it wasn't just, you know, a lot of us, we do work, we hand off the project and then we, um, you know, that's it. We don't really have a follow-up schedule in place. Like when we started doing this, it really started making a huge impact in the amount of leads we got. And not only that, but the quality of leads we got. Like I actually got a lot of this from one of our clients who's a real estate agent who hired us to build a simple tool that when they would close a deal, they would go in and type in the name, phone number, and closing date of that new uh, new sale they just got. And then it would add to their calendar automatically touch points like, you know, a month later, have you met the neighbors? Call them and ask them this. You know, three months later, uh, has anything broken? You know, call the, call them and ask them. A year later, congratulations on your one-year anniversary. Like these simple, like five-minute calls that they would do because realtors know how important it is mm -hmm. to keep your clients close and, and they're really, you know, that referrals are really the name of the game. So it's a way of just, I guess, systematizing the likelihood that referrals happen, which again, if you can have, let's say you have 10 past clients, if you can get a hundred people who are receiving value from you and receiving it constantly and, and, you know, and, and in a way that is outweighing their input, which at the, this point is their time, then they're going to be the best people to either become direct clients or refer people to you. So it's just a matter. I mean, that basically is like 10 X in your, your referral base without, 10 xing how many clients you work with. Yep, and that okay. That's I love that. That's gold. That's a really kind of really simple thing to put in place if you don't have that right now. Um, just like pinging old clients and and continue to follow up with them, huh? Exactly. Exactly. That's awesome. So now um, we're coming up on 40 minutes. So my last question will be, um, I guess, any bits of advice on anyone who is starting and growing some sort of agency or consultancy. I mean, we already have a lot here. There's a lot to take in, so I don't know if there's any other things that you generally like to uh, share um, with. Do you mean like growing a team or just starting out? Full -time Gro I would say growing a team. Yeah, so a um, bunch of advice around that. First off, sure. don't hire people around new projects. A uh, big mistake I made was get a big multi-month project, and then I'd hire somebody to help do it, right? And, um, you know, really hiring should be something – you need to think in terms of profit and loss statements, like think in terms of you're going to add a lot of liabilities to your payroll when you start to expand. Um, and to do that, you really need to make sure that you have a systematic way of getting high quality projects and also ideally have a backlog of work. I mean, again, if we, you do some of the things we talked about at the beginning, these recurring models, that greatly alleviates your need to drum up new work constantly. If you can get, let's say, a quarter of your revenue on retainer, that's a very good thing. Um, another thing I would suggest, which is how I started, would be a model that's more um, where you start with subcontractors instead of employees, where you're paying them either a percentage of what you're billing them out at, or like for instance, when I started, I was billing my team out at 135 an hour, and I paid 60% um, of that rate to the subs who were working for me. So I, I, what I ended up doing is I found really talented people who wanted to work independently but didn't want to deal with sales and marketing and invoicing and project management and all that stuff. They just wanted to sit there with their headphones on and code, which is great. Like there's nothing wrong with that. So the deal I had with them is um, I will give you, what well, it was like 81 an hour, I think it came out to, Eight, you know, basically 81 an hour to do that to do what you love, which is coding. And, but my role is going to be, I'm the one who's doing all the, the groundwork and, you know, finding the clients, selling the clients, um, dealing with getting us paid and all that kind of stuff. But the benefit of this is you can, you know, if you're paying them a percentage or something like that, or, or whatever else of, of a project, well, if the project disappears, you're not on the hook for 
paying them still. Whereas if they're employees, whether or not you have projects for them to work on, you're, you need to pay them. Um, <clears throat> so I would do more of a contract to hire model and take it slow, like hire slow, fire fast. It's probably one of the best things I ever learned and mm -hmm. one of the things that took me way too long to figure out. But um, you know, really, really don't just grow for the sake of growth. Really grow when you can, when you have the product, when you have the asset built up that is reliably bringing in the money you need to, um, to do that. And keep in mind, I mean, it depends, again, on where you live and the kind of people you hire. But, you know, my average fully loaded cost for a new employee would be nine, ten thousand a month. So every time I brought on somebody new, I had to know that I was going to make at a minimum nine to ten thousand a month on them. And if I couldn't guarantee that, then I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, again, early on, I didn't have to, I didn't know that. So I just hired for the for the hell of it. But um, later on, I really had to kind of internalize that. And now real quick on that, because I've, I've heard um, and I'm sure it's probably just like a different strokes, different for different folks kind of thing. But I'm just curious, like, what is your opinion then on like potentially hiring um, for future growth, like where you want to get to? Do you think that's a, that's like maybe a misnomer or? Oh, no, I I think that's what you should do. Like when you can't again, don't hire somebody because you've got a new project that they can work on. Right. Instead, hire when you can afford it. Um, so, you know, I would. Yes. I mean, obviously, like you want to you want to hire knowing that this person is going to strategically strategically help grow your business in this way versus yep. um, like what I did, which was, oh, I just hire I just one, this new client who needs design work, crap, I don't have a designer. I'm going to go find a, the first designer I can and hire them. Gotcha. Which you don't want to do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, you want to be strategic, especially if you want to break, like, let's say you want to start offering more full service things. Instead of just development, you want to offer design or marketing or, you know, copywriting or something like that. You should really figure out, first off, is this a service that I can sell? Um, mm -hmm. is this a service that I can find people who can help fulfill that? Can I find copywriters? Do I know how to sell copywriting? Do I know how to, how it fits into my larger business strategy? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's really when you want to do it. I mean, it's, it's like with any purchasing decision, I guess that you make in your business, right? Yep. Like it, you're doing it as an investment instead of just a crap, I need seats to fill. So I'm going to fill them as quickly as I can. Right. Totally. Okay. I get it. Awesome stuff, Brennan. Well, Hey, where can people, where's the best way for people to reach out to you and connect with you and connect with your work and, and find out more about you? So the best place is double your freelancing.com. Got about four or five years worth of free articles up there. Um, and I also have, if you go to free pricing course.com, the, the stuff we talked about in the beginning mm -hmm. of like, uh, figuring out the problem of behind a project and quantifying the, the value of it and so on. I have a, a nine lesson, actually. It used to be seven. Now it's a nine lesson free course all on that at freepricingcourse.com um, that you can take. Awesome. Yeah, I see it right here. Okay, that's great. Um, well, thank you so much, Brendan. It was a pleasure speaking, and this was really, um, really good stuff, and I really appreciate you sharing it. Yeah, thank you, Tom. All right, take care. And that wraps up another broadcast of In the Trenches. If you'd like to check out the show notes, just head over to tommorcus.com slash podcast, where you'll find the latest broadcast. And if you enjoyed today's broadcast, please do me a favor and leave a rating and review on iTunes. That's the fastest, simplest, easiest way to support my creative work, and it would really mean a lot to me. As always, this is Tom Morcus, and if you're listening to this, you are the resistance.